Hey, Restoration, what's going on? My name is Brian. I am uh, here with you in my basement uh, again because it's it's snowing outside and it feels like winter. And so I didn't want to shoot a video outside, so I decided to do it in my basement again today. And um, hopefully <laughs> this time there are, are no other distractions. We're in week two uh, of Game Changer. I hope you guys had a good Easter. I hope you're still celebrating Easter. I hope that uh, you you are living every day, treating every single day like Easter, like what we talked about on Easter. That we treat every single day like Easter. There's no um, there, there's no celebrating on one day and then and then uh, forgetting it for the other six three hundred sixty four days a year. If you remember that, maybe do you? I don't know. I hope you guys are adapting okay to online church, uh, wherever it is that you uh, go to church, wherever it is that, that you, you call home uh, for your church. And if it's here, then you're used to this. But for so many people, this is something brand new that just is, it doesn't make any sense. And, and, and what I think about during this time, especially for Christians, is that we find out what's incredibly important to us, don't we? We find out those things that are really, really important. Maybe the things that we're having a trouble letting go of. And in, in this game-changing moment, in, in, in week two, last week we talked about Jesus being that game-changing moment for us. And in week two, we're going to be talking about uh, things that will, will keep us back from a game-changing moment. I think about um, whenever you play cards. And I don't know if you're Baptist or you grew up Baptist, so you don't really want to say that you played cards. I, I don't blame you. I played cards growing up when, in fact, Euchre was the game of choice. If you live in Michigan, um, then then Euchre is, and, and you're a Baptist, and you can play cards. It seems like Euchre is the game to play. I played Euchre growing up. I learned when I was a kid and uh, in, in youth group in high school. Like, that was a main thing that we did. We would go on retreats, and we would have Euchre tournaments. And to this day, it continues. I, I don't play cards as much anymore. I just, uh, my attention span isn't there. Um, but... Uh, I used to play euchre quite a bit, and and in euchre there was always the the jack was the bower. That was your trump card. That means that if you lay, lay that card down, <clears throat> I like swallowed my spit. That was weird. If you lay that card down, that means that you have trumped everyone. That means that you uh you you get to take all of the cards. You get that hand. It means that no one else can beat your hand. You have this trump card and you lay it down and it's bam. This is the jack of hearts and hearts was called. So uh, hearts was trump, right? That's that's the, the the cards that you want to be able to get are all hearts. And uh, and if you lay that jack of hearts down, then then you get all the cards and you win that round. And sometimes I think we treat life <coughs> excuse me, we treat life that way. Like we keep holding on to these things that are that are so important to us, this this deck of cards of life, and we have a trump card that we're holding on to, right? We we do that. I I, I do that. I mean, with, with my finances, I want to make sure that I hold on to that that trump card, that I'm the one in charge of that. There's some cards that I feel are way too important for me to give up. And, and that, for me, happens to be one of them. And we're going to look at a story where Jesus calls out somebody's trump card, where Jesus calls out, especially right where somebody's in, in that moment. Because here's the deal for today. To, to have a game-changing moment, to have a game-changing moment in your life, we have to understand that God wants our hearts. That God wants what's on the inside. He wants the things that we love. We want to, he wants us to hand those over to Him. And too many times we hold on to those things like a trump card. But as we see in this story, God wants our hearts. And some of you probably, like me, growing up, are, are, are saying, I gave God my heart. When I, when I asked him into my heart, I, th that I asked him to come into my heart, and therefore, he has my heart. No, n not necessarily. I, I know a lot of people who, who said a prayer at some point in their life for Jesus to come into their life to save them, and their life doesn't look that much different than somebody who's never prayed that prayer. So it's more than just a prayer that we pray. It's, it's a turning. It's a repenting that we need to look at. Did you know that, that the sinner's prayer, quote unquote, the sinner's prayer, we, we don't find that in the Bible. 
And if you're like me and you grew up in a in a in a church that we wanted to make sure that that you prayed a certain prayer that got you into heaven. And that prayer was the most important thing. No, the response from that prayer is the most important thing. Sometimes, see, it's easy to not give God our hearts fully when we think that at one point in our life we said a prayer so we're good. We don't have to do anything else anymore. We think that everything's fine, everything's good. If we, if we just said that prayer that one time, that means that my heart's clean and I'm good and I can go on living my life the way that I want to. And friends, we missed the point completely when we live that way. When we live in a way that's like, I did one thing uh, for God and it was, I, I said a prayer and so now I'm good. We missed the whole point of why Jesus came. We missed the whole point of him setting us free if we believe that just saying one prayer is, is enough. Now, don't get me wrong. Our response to that life is enough. And, and when we decide in that moment to say, Jesus, I want to follow you, And I'm sorry for what I've done. The prayer is not wrong. The prayer is good. But we put too much emphasis on the prayer, I think, than we did what the prayer meant. We put too much emphasis, I'm going to say it again, on the prayer than what comes next. It was an easy way for us to see how many people got saved and, you know, if they kept following Jesus, whatever. I mean, there was one kid I remember in, in um, we did this thing called Awana. I don't know if you're a uh, ghetto like me, but we, a Christian ghetto like me, but we we did something called Awana. Approved workmen are not ashamed. They still do Awana somewhere around wherever you're at, probably. And what we learned in Awana is, is all of these Bible verses, and, and, and we had these events where people could come and people could get, quote-unquote, saved. If they said this prayer, we had vacation Bible school, and we were, the whole point was just to say this one prayer. And then we let them loose, we let them go. And there was this kid in my school who said a prayer when he was in junior high or something like that. And then coming out of that in, in high school, he, he turned away from God for a really long time until he became an adult. Then he finally found his way back to God. And I'm so happy that he is following Jesus now and, and pursuing him and has that passion. But that's what's going to happen is if we, if we just treat it as one prayer, if we just treat all of this as just say a prayer and you're done, then we're not going to have disciples. We're not going to have people passionate about the word. We're not going to have um, that thing. And, and what happened was in the 90s and, and some of that, we had this, this idea that people needed to, to get saved. And we, we started all of these churches that were very, um, uh, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? They were very light, um, Seeker friendly. That's the word I'm looking for. We have these seeker friendly churches that just were really pushing that. Just say a prayer and you're good. Just say a prayer and you're good. They wanted to get as many people in as they possibly could. And it wasn't a bad thing for them to try to do. It was trying to make the gospel more accessible. But in doing so, we we kind of let some of the other stuff go and say, okay, let's just focus on saying that prayer. Let's just focus on getting people in the doors. Let's just focus on getting our our numbers there. So let's make it really entertaining. And I'm not saying don't make church entertaining. Make it as entertaining as you possibly can because there are people that need to be reached. And we're doing our best to make it as entertaining as possible. But the danger becomes that we make it, I I don't want to say too easy, but we make it too easy. See, Jesus didn't have a ton of followers at the end of his ministry. It grew like crazy. I mean, if you do a bunch of miracles and you feed 5,000, he was an attractional person, but he said some stuff that really cut through. And it says in one portion of scripture that people actually left. They, They thought he was crazy. And so they left his ministry because of the things that he was saying. So having a seeker friendly church is not wrong as long as we are protecting the integrity of the gospel. I'm going on off on a bunny trail now, and I haven't even started our story yet. So, what I'm trying to say is God wants our hearts. He wants our hearts, and that's a deeper commitment. It's a deeper level of commitment. And the story that we find today is in Matthew 19, and we're choosing a very familiar passage of Scripture for this story. This is from Matthew, his 
his account of the life of Jesus. And he remembers this moment. It stuck with Matthew. Remember, before all of this started, Matthew was a rich guy. He also went by Levi. He was a tax collector. He was one of the people that Jesus called to follow him. And and Matthew left all of that and followed him. And and I think the reason that this really sticks with Matthew is he could have had this response to Jesus, but he didn't. And we see the difference between this one guy and Matthew. Matthew was able to write a whole book (laughs) <laughs> about Jesus, his account of Jesus, and his life was forever changed. And we see the difference with, with the guy that we're going to read about. This is the only time you hear about him. And then he goes off and does his own thing. And so the, the challenge, I'm getting to a challenge already, and I haven't even read the story yet. The challenge for us is to respond to Jesus by giving him our hearts and not holding on to that trump card. And see what God does with that. Are you just going to be a blip in a Bible story? Or are you going to be someone who writes about Jesus, who follows him completely? And that's for you to decide and not me. I mean, it's for me to decide too, but I can't decide it for you. Do you know what I'm saying? You got to go with me sometimes, all right? It's crazy. I'm talking to a phone like you're responding and you're not. Unless you are, so thank you. But you're probably not. But you might be. Okay, enough stalling. On to the scripture. Matthew 19, starting in verse 16. I'm reading from the NLT, New Living Translation, if you want to follow along here. All right. Verse, I'm sorry, I said, did I say six? I don't know what verse I said. 16, starting in verse 16. Someone came to Jesus with this question. Teacher, some translations say good teacher, what good deed must I do to have eternal life? I'm going to get back to that. I'm not going to do it right now. (laughs) I thought about going right there. I'm just going to keep reading. All right. Why ask me, starting verse 17, why ask me about what is good? Jesus replied, there is only one who is good. But to answer your question, if you want to receive eternal life, keep the commandments. Okay, great. Dude's like, bro, got it down. I am going to keep every command. You don't even know, man. I keep commandments. That's what this guy's saying. He's like, oh, yes, nailed it. Cool, yeah. Right? He's like, he got the answer right in Sunday school, and he's been following the commandments ever since. Because watch his reply. Which ones? The man asked. He's making sure he's not getting trapped, right? And Jesus replied, You must not murder. You must not commit adultery. You must not steal. You must not testify falsely. Honor your father and mother. Love your neighbor as yourself. So he's kind of going through, you know, the Big Ten. Uh, No doubt that this guy is very familiar with them. And he's like, got this in the bag. I've got this in the bag. But again, he doesn't want to be too proud because he's heard about this good teacher, right? There's a reason he's asking this good teacher about what he must do in order to enter into the kingdom of heaven. This is a, a person who, who has some schooling, who knows some stuff, who's been around. So he says, I've obeyed all these commandments, the young man replied. I just, I, I see this guy like with a puffed up chest, me like, I am so good on this. Like, you don't even know. Like, I, I have never broken a commandment, really. I mean, if you really think about it, I mean, I may have lied once or twice, maybe, maybe three times. But I've never broken a commandment. I mean, you could, there's some gray areas, you know, but I feel like I'm living a pretty good life. I feel like I'm I'm a good person. Does that sound familiar? I feel like I'm a pretty good person. I do a lot of good things. I help the homeless. I I give to Restoration Church. I I give to my local church. I, I give to the food bank. I do so much good, is what this guy's saying. I've obeyed all these commandments, the young man replied. And he senses that something is still lacking. Do you ever feel that? Like, man, I'm, I'm living this Christian life. I'm, 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 I'm trying to do all of the right things. I'm trying to make a difference in people's lives. And I'm, and I'm doing a whole bunch of stuff. But something just doesn't 
feel right. In fact, some of my actions are, are the same actions of when I thought I started following Jesus. So some, of, some of the things that I struggle with are still things that I struggle with today. And to be honest with you, I don't really care about putting up a fight with some of these things. I'm tired of fighting. Just something, I don't feel complete. And I feel like I'm a good person. Why, why do I feel that way? Have you been there? Because this guy has. Listen to his next question. What else must I do? Jesus, I'm, I'm obeying all the commandments. I, what else do I have to do? I don't understand. W what are the things now that I'm supposed to be doing? Verse 21, here's the kicker. Jesus told him, If you want to be perfect, go and sell all your possessions and give the money to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven. Then, come, follow me. This guy had a lot of wealth. He had tons of money. And Jesus picked the one thing. The one thing that he didn't, the, the rich young ruler, didn't want to hear. And the next part is sad. This is the difference between Matthew and this rich young ruler who is unnamed. Verse 22. But when the young man heard this, he went away sad, for he had many possessions. Then Jesus said to his disciples, I tell you the truth, it is very hard for a rich person to enter the kingdom of heaven. That's a warning for us. I'll say it again, it's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich person to enter the kingdom of God. The disciples were astounded. Then... Who in the world can be saved? They asked. Huh? Who? The, Jesus, this doesn't make any sense to me at all. Who in the world can be saved if, if this guy who's following all of the commandments and he just won't do that one thing? God, Jesus, if you're saying rich people can't, I mean, it's easier. I, I, Jesus, we, we don't understand. We're, 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 we're completely astounded. We've never heard this before. We heard that you're supposed to just follow law, and, and that's the only thing that you do, that you're just supposed to follow a set of rules, and you're good. Jesus, how does that, how, I, I, we don't understand this at all. How is that even possible? Now you're saying that we can't even follow all the rules and be good? Jesus looked at them intently and said, Humanly speaking, it is impossible. Here's the most important verse, or second half of verse. But with God, everything is possible. God wants our hearts. On your own, it's impossible. But God wants our hearts. And when we give our hearts to God, everything is possible. With God, everything is possible. And if we just live our lives like we're just saying a prayer. We said a prayer and now I can go on with the rest of my life. Me and God are good because I said a prayer when I was four and now here I am. 35, I'm married, I'm, I've been twice divorced and now I'm married again and then and, uh, and I rip people off. But you know what? I said a prayer when I was five years old. I, you know what I do? I look at a whole bunch of stuff on the internet that's not appropriate for me to look at. But you know what? I said a prayer when I was five, so we're good. You know, God doesn't have your heart. You pretend like God has your heart. You have an issue with, with with what I'm saying here. Take it up with God. 
But I say that, that that's, that's, that's baloney. I don't know why I said baloney, but that's baloney. God wants our hearts. And here, so now I'm going to get to the points, okay? <laughs> here we go. There's a hint here about what this, this rich young ruler really thought about Jesus. And it's in the very beginning when he just says, good teacher, or just teacher. See, he hasn't made Jesus Lord of his life, so he's still holding on to all of his possessions. And so for us, what I decide about Jesus directs my life. Let me say that again. What, you can write this down if you want to. In fact, I would encourage you to highlight, if you have a Bible right now, highlight in your Bible, teacher. Just highlight that. And put a little question mark by it. And that'll remind you, when you read that scripture, when you read your Bible, and you open it up, write a little question mark on it. And if you're like, I use a tablet, I don't know what I'm supposed to do. Well, that, you know what? I don't know either. So just pretend that you're making a question mark, or right? You can still highlight in the Bible app. I know that. And then put a little note on it and, and a question mark. Okay, got it? Good. What I decide about Jesus directs my life. Now, if I believe that Jesus is just a good teacher, then me giving up everything doesn't make any sense. And for this dude right here, the rich young man, the rich man says if he just says teacher, then obviously he doesn't want to give up all of his stuff. See, he wants a little bit of Jesus. He wants to, enough to make himself look good, but he doesn't want to give up any of his stuff. He wants to look the part, but he doesn't want to have to give up anything. Does that sound familiar? Because this is cutting me right to the core right now. Jesus, I'll follow you, okay? I'll follow your commandments. That's what we say. We'll say, Jesus, I'll, I'll follow your commandments, but I'm not going to follow you. You're a good teacher. I'll listen to what you have to say, and I'll apply some of those things to my life, but I'm not going to make you Lord of my life. I'm not going to make you king of my life. Are, are you crazy? Do you know my life? Do you know how much stuff I have? You're just going to ask me to give it all away. If he's not important, then I hold on to my stuff. If Jesus is not who I make him out to be, if he's not everything that he says he is in Scripture, then I keep holding on to my stuff. If I don't believe that, if I don't actualize that in my own life, that Jesus is everything that he says he is, and his desires need to be my desires, and his pursuit needs to be my desires, if, if, that's, if that's what I believe, then I don't hold on to a single bit of anything. I, I let it all go. I give it all over to him, and I let him direct my life. But if he's not important to me, then why give it up? Do you ever, I don't know if you ever really enjoy going to concerts or any of those types of things, but there are certain bands that I will pay lots of money to go see. I mean, you got to get the classics out of the way, right? So I've gone and seen U2 before, and that cost a bit of money. I'm supposed to see the Foo Fighters soon, and I don't know when that's going to be because of the stupid coronavirus, but and it was supposed to be in May, now it's going to be in October. So I pay money to go see the Foo Fighters, right? But I wouldn't pay money to go see Katy Perry. I wouldn't pay money to go see uh, somebody else. I, I would pay whatever they wanted to go see the Avid Brothers or 21 Pilots. Whatever that is, I will, I will pay it. So there's some things I deem important that's worth my financial giving, that's worth my financial dollars, the hard-earned dollars that I have, that I will go and give that uh, to them and be like, okay, now entertain me. There's certain worth that we put on things that we're willing to pay. Some movies I'll go see in the movie theater. Some movies I won't go see. Most comedies I'm not going to go see in the movie theater, no matter how good they are. And, and now I really don't see many movies at all in the movie theater because it's so dang expensive. And I've got a good setup at home, as you can see with these speakers here behind me. Things that I deem important to me are important to me. And here's how I know if you're committed. Do you know that if you're committed to something, 
usually there's financial backing. And I am not, I'm not guilt tripping you. I'm not saying anything that, um, to, to try to get you to give to Restoration Church. I, I don't care what you do. But all I'm saying is that if you're committed to something, your wallet will follow. And if you're committed to Jesus, then commit to his church, wherever that is for you. This is not a time for you just to give that up and say, well, okay, uh, we're in a pandemic now, so I'm going to stop giving. Pfft. No, you don't. And again, this is not a plea for you to continue to, to, to give to restoration or anything. I'm just saying for you personally, wherever you are at, it might mean you have to give less. It might mean that you have to make some other adjustments. But what's the first thing for you to go during this pandemic? Was it Netflix or was it your tithe? If he's not important, then I keep my stuff. But if Jesus is worth everything, everything else is worth less. If Jesus is worth everything, everything else is worth less. Write that down. And we're going to go over to uh, Philippians 3. Real, I don't know how quick we're going to do this. Um, in Philippians 3, we've got a bit more to go, so I'm going to try to hustle up. Philippians 3, starting in verse 7, says this. I once, This is Paul talking. The mega Christian, the the top of the food chain Christian. All right, you've got Jesus, you've got a tie probably between Peter and Paul. Fair, that's fair. Maybe Billy Graham. I don't know. Who knows? All right, here I am wasting time. I once thought Philippians three verse seven. I once thought these things were valuable, but now I consider them worthless because of what Christ has done. Yes, everything else is worthless when compared with the infinite value of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. For his sake, I have discarded everything else, counting it all as garbage, as rubbish. In the original translation, it would have been the S-word. I counted it all. It was that strong of an exclamation. I count it all as, you know what? For this, uh, so that I could gain Christ and become one with him. What does it take to gain Christ? To consider everything else as garbage. I was walking down, um, we go for a lot of walks now because, well, we've got time. And I was walking down the, uh, the, the road with our, with our family and our two dogs. And um, some of them were on bikes and, and we're just walking. And we, we walked by this house that had a whole, like, the, it was getting renovated. And I don't know who had owned the house before, but there was a... A dumpster like a huge yard dumpster full of what looked like garbage and then in the back of the yard you could see even more piles of garbage it was like this a scene from Wally -E <laughs> when 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 everybody's gone and it's just on earth and there's just piles of garbage everywhere and they were cleaning out this house and it took a long I mean they're still cleaning it out probably right now. I shouldn't say that out loud because you're probably not supposed to be doing that, but they have been cleaning out this house for a really long time. There was so much junk in this house. Can you just imagine living that way? I mean, maybe you do, and I'm really sorry if I'm calling you out on this, but we call those people hoarders. Have you ever watched that show? That hoarder show where they just, they have so much junk and they think that everything is of value to them. And we're looking around the room, right? You go in there and you watch the episode and they go in there and they're like, what, why do you, why do you have a leftover bullet from 1935? What, what, what is the good of this newspaper that has nothing interesting on it from 1920? Why do you have to have piles 
and piles of knickknacks? Why did you go to Goodwill and just buy the store and put it in your house? That just doesn't make any sense to me. You walk through this house and you just go, how do you live like this? How, how, how is this okay for you? Don't you want to clean that? Don't you, are you tired of just having one trail that goes to the kitchen, that goes to the bathroom, that goes to the bed, to the chair? Sometimes I think Jesus is looking at our lives. He's like, how, how did we, how did you miss this? We've got a whole pile of junk in our lives that we think we know better. We think we need to hold on to something because we know better. And Jesus is like, why are, I came to give you life, not for you to just to hoard all of your junk. Paul says, I count it all as loss. I count it all as a waste. There's a profit and loss statement, right? Where you've got the profit on one side and you've got your losses on one and you calculate both of them. What Paul is saying is he considers everything in this life goes in the loss column. Why? For the sake of knowing Jesus Christ, his Lord and Savior. He counts everything else as loss. And so, church, What are you going to do with that? What are you going to do with that? Whatever you're holding on to. You wonder why there hasn't been a game-changing moment for you? What trump card are you still holding on to? Jesus says that in that story of the rich young ruler that for man this is impossible. If you're thinking right now, there I, I don't know what I'm <laughs> I don't know how to do that. I don't how do I let go? How do I how do I know what's right and what's wrong? How do I know what God's calling me to? Maybe you're thinking, I don't even know how that's possible. And you're right. Humanly, it's not possible. But with God, everything is possible. With God, everything is possible. Are you convicted about something you need to give up today? Well, guess what? You're not going to be able to give it up on your own. But with God, everything is possible. And you can invite God into your life right now if you want to. You can pray a prayer. But this prayer is different. You say, God, I, I've been holding on to so much junk. In fact, Do it with me if you would. God, I've been holding on to so much junk. And I need to make a move for you. God, help me to clean out the junk in my life and give it over to you. God, help me to counted all this loss for the greatness of knowing you. It's in your name. Amen. And we're not done yet, so sorry. Not sorry. The way that this is possible, just like those hoarders (laughs) <laughs> that have somebody come in and help them clean house. I mean, there's no way that a hoarder is able to do it on their own. They need somebody else. They need a helper to come in and help them clean that house up. They need somebody else to come in and help take care of all of that garbage, especially when it's things that they still deem important. 
there's still things that they're holding on to that they think is really important. And it takes somebody from the outside, somebody of influence to come and be like, that. maybe it's a son or a daughter or a mom or a dad or a relative or a best friend say, that stuff's not important anymore. Let go. I can't do that. Well, I, I'm going to help you. And that's where we find hope because in John chapter 14, Jesus is talking to his disciples at the end, the night before he's, he's crucified at the Last Supper. And it starts in verse 16, and it says, And I will ask the Father, and he will give you another advocate, or helper, or ambassador, or encourager, or counselor, or comforter, any of those words who will never leave you. He is the Holy Spirit who leads into all truth. The world cannot receive him because it isn't looking for him. But you know him because he lives with you now and later will be in you. See, Jesus had to go so that he could give us the Holy Spirit. We have this advocate who is cheering us on every time we throw something away, every time we get rid of something, every time we give something up to him. We have this advocate who's spurring us on. The Holy Spirit, if you're listening to him, will tell you where to go and what to do, and you're not going to get it right every time. You might throw something away and be like, I actually think I was supposed to hold on to that. That might happen. But there's grace in those moments. The advocate is coming to the Father on your behalf. And in other scripture, in that he keeps talking about the Holy Spirit, Jesus does. And he keeps talking about how that's going to work and, and how he that is in you is greater than he who is in the world. He's a communicator for us. He, he's going to the Father for us. And we have this beautiful power inside of us when we ask the Holy Spirit in and we let Him tell us what to throw away and what not to throw away. When we do that, that's the game-changing moment. My friends, when we bend to God, that is the game-changing moment. We have a helper. His name is the Holy Spirit an advocate. And for a lot of us, we're not listening to that anymore. We're too comfortable with our jobs and our comforts of life to say, I'm going to listen to the Holy Spirit. And we don't want to listen to the Holy Spirit because we know that the Holy Spirit is going to convict us on the things that we're still holding on to. And I'm not telling you that the Holy Spirit is telling you right now to quit your job and to go live in the jungles of Africa promoting the gospel. I'm not saying that he is telling you to do that. I'm not saying that he's not telling you to do that. But all I'm asking is, are you listening to the Holy Spirit? And am I listening to the Holy Spirit? And I can't answer that for you. I can only answer that for me. So what trump card are you still holding on to? Make a decision about Jesus in your life. Make a decision. Decide about Jesus. Is he just a good teacher to you or is he worth pursuing? Is he worth following? Jesus had very few followers at the end. Like I said in the beginning, he had very few followers at the end of his ministry. It's a hard call. So decide about Jesus. Allow the Holy Spirit to be the helper in your life. And the game-changing moment is when we bend to God. That's all I've got for you today. I pray that you are staying safe. And uh, I hope to see you again next week. We'll see ya.